Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. This is episode number 1146. This is your host, Matt Breckwald, and it is my pleasure to be with you for our Tuesday edition this week. Well, so this episode is, I think, unlike any episode that I've ever done before. You know, I like to focus on interviews. On Tuesdays, I like to give you updates on what's going on on our farm how things are coming along for us. Uh, And occasionally I like to take the opportunity on a Tuesday because I have the freedom to do that, uh, to be able to put forth a subject that may help you in the development of your farm, may help you uh, be sustainable in your business or whatever that may be. Now, for those of you watching on Facebook, I know I'm saying Tuesday a lot. That's because I record my Tuesday episodes on Mondays, uh, the day before they come out. So that's why I keep saying that. So today is a lot different because uh, just, I guess when I woke up today and I started reading the news, I kept seeing these news stories about uh, the United Nations and this, uh, this report that they're coming out with uh, that's basically saying Code Red. They've titled it Code Red, saying that we're in a condition red or Code Red in terms of global warming in the United States. Well, in the whole world, excuse me, I shouldn't say the United States. But from my perspective, you know, I keep hearing more and more and more about this. And uh, it's it's time that, I don't know, it's it's time to take it seriously, whether or not you believe it's human caused or not. I think it's clear that the climate is warming. I don't think there's any question there. Now, the science behind why it would be human caused, I think, is pretty strong. But I certainly don't know enough to come to a full conclusion on that. I am not a scientist. I'm not a chemist, a meteorologist, or anything like that. So I can't do that. But with that said, regardless of what your opinion is, regardless of what my opinion is, it is a serious issue that selfishly is going to impact us in agriculture, and particularly those of us who like to raise cattle or any rumen animal, but especially cattle, it is going to affect us, and it's already there's already being things said and already being attempts being made that will impact us in what it is that we love to do. So, I really got to thinking about that when I was seeing all these articles coming out today talking about this report and calling it Code Red and really ramping up the fear of global warming. And like I said, I cannot speak to any of of what's fact or what's not fact or what's real or what's hype. I can't speak to any of that, but I am here to deal in what is reality today. And that is that there are people that are blaming cattle producers for global warming. And that got me to researching this. And I came across a very, very interesting article. So, you know, cattle producers are one of the targets of environmental groups that are concerned about global warming. And this contention here is that cattle production is one of the most harmful practices in agriculture uh, or in any industry, really, for global warming because cattle expel methane, and methane is 28 times more potent, and I read that as 28 times more efficient at trapping heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide is. Well, that's not great news. If that's where the story ends for us, if that's just that's what the facts are and that's where it ends, that's really not great news for cattle producers now, is it? Uh, But those of us who enjoy raising cattle or other ruminants, by the way, uh, we need to be concerned about this contention for a couple of reasons. No matter what your belief about the validity of it is, you need to be concerned for a couple of reasons. First is if it's true. If this is actually true, then for us to protect the livelihood we love, the the industry we love, the lifestyle that we love, we need to innovate ourselves out of this. We need to innovate solutions to this problem, and we need to do it very soon. Otherwise, other people from outside of our industry are going to legislate what they believe will be appropriate solutions, and it's going to damage our industry. It's going to make it very difficult for us to continue in the lifestyle that we love. But let's say that it's not true. Okay, so if it's not true, there are still groups that are going to continue to spread this, if it were not to be true, this misinformation and claim that it's true. 
And that would create anti-cattle production sentiment. And then our industry would be harmed. But this time, in this scenario, it would be harmed without merit because it would be untrue. But of course, perception is reality, right? So if they do a better job than us of educating the public, except they're educating the public on misinformation, then all of a sudden perception becomes reality. It still harms our industry just as much. And if that is the case, then we need to educate ourselves to fight back against this. So I have been concerned about this issue and what I've been hearing about methane production for quite some time. And honestly, uh, with me, global warming, I, I mean, I've talked about this on the show before. I don't think there's any question that we're warming. The causal factors, I'd say the jury is still out on that for me. I'm still researching, wanting to know how much of this, how much of that, how much is natural, you know, how much is natural tendencies of the earth, how much is it what we're doing since industrialization and the use of fossil fuels and all that type of stuff. I'm still researching that, trying to come to a conclusion on my own. But I've been very concerned about this issue because honestly, for cattle producers, this has looked like a no-win situation. But now today, with all these articles coming out that say code red and it's very scary and all this type of stuff regarding global warming, I really sat down and I started doing some research on it. I was just compelled to this morning. And I came across a very, very interesting article put out by the University of California at Davis. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, a couple things, the California uh, University System and UC Davis, uh, let me just give you just a little bit of background. So the California University system is kind of two-tiered. They have the state colleges like Fresno State University, Chico State University, which is one of the two places, had I stayed in California, I would have gone to have studied agriculture. And then they have the University of California system, which is like the next tier up, much more difficult to get into, higher standards to enter, and a lot more research being done there. And UC Davis, when it comes to agriculture, is one of the premier research institutions we have in this country. And so when I saw this article pop up, I definitely wanted to take a look. And I came across this article. This comes from, this came out in November of 2020. And I've got a link to it in the show notes for you. And it's dealing with methane emissions from cattle. And I wanted to share it with you on this episode because I want to help arm you with the correct information. Now, I have been going through this article for the last two hours. I read it this morning, went through it, and I've been going going through it for the last two hours trying to trying to get to where I could explain this to you in some sort of a reasonable fashion because the science and all of that uh, certainly is over my head. Um, you know, chemist, I think my last chemistry class was in high school. Um, I had to bail out a pre-vet and just get an animal science degree. I, I just don't have a scientific aptitude, but I've broken this down and uh, I think that I can hopefully explain this to you so you can go out and you can defend cattle production when it comes to this talk of global warming and methane emissions. I'm very, very excited about what I read today, and I'm really, really eager to to share it with all of you. So the the article, which was put out by the University of Davis, uh, University of California at Davis, it it really centers around the research of a professor there named Frank Mitloner. And I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, It's M-I-T-L-O-E-H-N-E-R. And he's a professor there doing research on these methane emissions there at the University of California, Davis. And uh, we'll start out, I want to let you know what it said about what the sources of methane emissions are. Uh, This is what's listed in the article. So cattle and, of course, other ruminants, our sheep, our goats, um, they are sources of methane emission. And then the extraction... Of fossil fuels. So pulling fossil fuels out of the earth is another source of uh, methane emissions. And organic waste in landfills as it decomposes and wetlands, all of those. Then, of course, the burning of fossil fuels as well. Or, excuse me, that's a source of carbon dioxide, which we'll get into here in a second. So those are our sources of methane. And the reason we're focusing on methane, again, is because according to uh, everything that I've read about this, methane is 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide, meaning it's 28 times better at trapping heat 
in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And therefore, if, again, if you stopped right there, then it would look like, well, this is really a no-win situation for cattle producers because if cattle are belching or farting methane, right, um, and it's 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide, how can we even possibly expect to continue uh, to, producing, to be producing cattle uh, on any scale whatsoever if it's that bad? But it's not that bad, and that is really the exciting part about this article. So this article goes on to talk about the biogenic cycle. Now, I want to take a second before I try and explain what the biogenic cycle is when it comes to carbon dioxide and methane, cattle, and all of that. I don't think this is something that necessarily all of us have seen through our public education, you know, growing up in high school, middle school, whatever that may be. But I know we've all seen something in some science class about the water cycle. So think about the water cycle for a moment. Now, if you remember the diagrams they would have of the water cycle, the diagram would have, you know, on, on one side of the, of the picture, there would be the ocean. And then as you move from left to right, uh, you would come to the beach and you would see a nice river flowing into the ocean. And that river would be cascading down a mountain. And that mountain over on the right-hand side of the picture would be covered in snow. It would be snow-capped peaks or something like that. And then above those mountains, you would see clouds. And you would see out over the ocean on the left-hand side of the picture, you would see arrows pointing upwards into the clouds, and you would see the uptake of water vapor from the ocean into those clouds. Those clouds would be moving, uh, you know, inland over those mountains. And when those, mountain, uh, when those clouds got over those mountains, uh, then they would rise up, they would cool, that water would condense become water droplets again no longer water vapor it would fall back to the earth and it would flow down the mountain back into the ocean and the cycle would repeat itself so if you look at that diagram and you think about that water cycle that we were all taught about in grammar school or in high school or whenever you saw it the amount of water that was present was constant right it never changed. It just went through this cycle. It just went through this circle. And I know I'm simplifying this, but in essence, it was constant. Now, if environmental conditions changed, so for example, if the earth got warmer, then the level of water in the ocean would rise because the snow on top of those mountains would melt and more water would flow into the ocean. And vice versa, if it got cooler, the level of the ocean would drop because more of that water that dropped on those mountains would stay up there frozen as snow or as ice. But it was a constant amount of water. So, does that mean that's all the water that exists on the planet Earth? No, that does not mean that. There, of course, is water that is coming out of aquifers, uh, you know, that flows out of natural springs. But, of course, there is water filtering down into those springs, so that remains constant. But the moment we go out and we drill a well or we dig a well and we start bringing up water that isn't normally flowing out of a natural stream or something like that that wasn't part of that water cycle, now we're, we're adding, we're contributing additional water into the water cycle. We're actually increasing the amount of water. So when we, when we think of carbon dioxide and we think of methane and we think of this biogenic, this biogenic cycle, which uh, for the featured image on my website today, I put a photograph uh, that UC Davis put up. I snapped a screenshot of it and I put it up so you could see it. When we think of this biogenic cycle, we're thinking of the exact same thing, only now with carbon dioxide, not with water. So the biogenic cycle uh, works like this when it comes to carbon dioxide. You have plants that are growing. And we all know from learning about photosynthesis in grammar school, in high school, that during photosynthesis, the plants will uptake carbon dioxide and they will use that carbon dioxide to grow. And when the plants grow, you know, when grasses grow, uh, when forbs and when shrubs grow, when anything that's edible by cattle grows, it's creating cellulose. And of course, ruminant animals are awesome because through the ruminant digestive system, they can digest cellulose, but monogastrics like you and me, we cannot. 
So that's what makes ruminant so special is they can take all this cellulose and all this carbon and they can turn that into protein, a very nutritious, uh, rich in minerals and vitamins, protein dense food. They can do wonderful things with that and it really, really is a miracle uh, with what ruminants can do. It's a wonderful thing. So this biogenic cycle, uh, this carbon that's in the atmosphere is being, being taken in by these plants. These plants are growing. They're generating the cellulose, and then the cattle are coming along, and they are eating, and they're digesting this cellulose, and of course, they are eating, and they are digesting the carbon that helped to create uh, the cellulose, that helped to create these plants. And when they do that, a portion of the carbon that they have digested is now being emitted as methane and again it's important to note that it's being emitted as methane because methane of course is 28 times more potent in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide hey everybody just a quick break from this episode to talk about our great sponsors and of course you know i love the company that i get to be affiliated with here on the show lacrosse footwear you can find them over at lacrossefootwear.com done right since 1897 lacrosse footwear has been making quality boots for hunting working and tending the land for over a century and uh, i will tell you what i absolutely love their boots i bought their alpha range boots with my very own money and it solved the problem that i was having which was i was buying a brand new pair of chore boots every single year well, lacrosse put an end to that for me. I have never had a pair of chore boots last longer, hold up better, or perform better than the Alpha Range boots from lacrosse. I use them every single day of the year in the summer irrigating, the winter feeding, and I could not be more pleased. That's why we recommend lacrosse to you all. We want you to go on over to lacrossefootwear.com, find the right boots for you, and let's get you into a pair today. And then, of course, Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. They've been out there over 80 years out here in the West developing livestock handling equipment for the farmers and ranchers who choose to raise the beef that feeds all of us throughout our entire country. And I'll tell you what, if you're going to work with animals that large, you have to have the right equipment. Otherwise, you cannot treat those animals humanely. They might need to be treated for something like pink eye. They might need their hooves trimmed. They might need to be vaccinated. They might need to be drenched. Whatever it is, you need the right equipment so you can do that. And I'll tell you what, Powder River makes that equipment. They understand that there are large producers and that there are small producers. And depending on which you are, the level of equipment that you need changes. And so does your budget. So they acknowledge that and they make a line of equipment for both of us, large ranchers, large farmers, or small farmers like myself. Now, if I'm only going to run 20 head through a squeeze chute on an annual basis rather than 2,000, well, my equipment can be a little bit different, and it also can be a little bit less expensive. Powder River knows that, and that's why they're willing to take the time to make two different lines, two different areas of equipment, depending on your particular situation. Everybody, go on over to powderriver.com. Check out their entire line of products, I guarantee that you can make your setup perfect for what will work for you. And of course, let your local farm and ranch retailer know that you want to see that Powder River Green out in their sales yard so you also can have the finest in livestock handling equipment. All right, well, back to this episode. So now that we're back uh, from the commercial, let me talk about the emission of methane. So cattle through belches, through farts, they're emitting methane into the atmosphere but again keep in mind the water cycle and what we all learned about the water cycle in school and the way it works and there's there's always the same amount of water it's just being stored in different ways and the cycle is repeating itself so when cattle emit methane into the atmosphere it goes into the atmosphere as methane and it stays methane for about 10 to 12 years. The article talks about a 12 year cycle, but it also mentions that it's got about a 10 year half life. And when it reaches that 10 to 12 year period, it breaks down and it turns back into carbon. And that carbon that it turns back into is the exact carbon that was in that plant when it first ate that plant. And so now that carbon gets 
reabsorbed back into growing plant materials and the cycle then repeats itself. This is the exact same carbon that was in the air prior to being consumed or prior to being turned to cellulose and being consumed by cattle. It's the exact same carbon. So this is working just like the water cycle. You've got a certain amount of carbon out there in the atmosphere. That carbon existed in our atmosphere well before humans were here and, of course, well before industrialization and the extraction and the burning of fossil fuels. And cattle uptake that. They use it. They emit some of it out as methane. About 12 years later, it turns back into carbon dioxide. It is reintroduced into the soil and into plants uh, through... Uh, through, oh, I'm going to forget the term now, you know, with chlorophyll and all the things, <laughs> that the way the plants grow, photosynthesis, there we go. It's reintroduced into the plants through photosynthesis, and then it gets eaten again by another ruminant, and it gets uh, digested again, emitted as methane again, 12 years later, turned back into carbon dioxide, back into the plants. It's just one big circle. So essentially, uh, when this is happening, this is a net zero, this, it's basically the production of cattle when it comes to carbon dioxide is carbon neutral. Now, that's the way I read this article. I'm certain if I got Dr. Uh, Mitloner here on the, on the show, uh, he could correct me on that. But by and large, what I read in the article is that when it comes to carbon dioxide and the warming of uh, the atmosphere through global warming, cattle production, the use of ruminants, is essentially a net zero. It's essentially carbon neutral. Now, there are things that can alter that, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second, but it's essentially carbon neutral. Now, as far as methane being 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide, that remains true. However, according to the article, carbon dioxide will stay in our atmosphere for, at least supplemental carbon dioxide will stay in our atmosphere for at least a thousand years, and then the article says many, many times, or possibly indefinitely never goes away. But methane is only up there for 12 years, and then it breaks down into carbon dioxide. And remember where this methane came from. It came from the carbon that was in the plants, and so it's just getting recycled back into the plants. It is a complete net zero. It's completely carbon neutral. So that is really, really good news, and I think that's an important thing for all of you who want to raise cattle or other ruminants to know because when somebody comes to you and says that cattle are really bad for the environment, especially in terms of global warming, because they emit methane, you need to be armed with this information, that there's a 12-year, 10 to 12-year half-life on the methane, and that there is uh, that it's a net zero, that it's, it's just like the water cycle. It's going right back into those plants. Now, cattle are not introducing new methane. They are not introducing new methane into the environment. They are introducing methane into the environment, um, which, of course, uh, is NH4. So it's, uh, or excuse me, I shouldn't even try and get into that. I am not a chemist. But it's not additional carbon dioxide. And when it breaks down into carbon dioxide after 12 years, it is not additional carbon dioxide. So there is, it's a net zero. But extracting and burning fossil fuels now, that is like the example when we talked about the water cycle of when they drill that well and they pull water out of that water table. They pull water out, the groundwater out. They're introducing new water into the water cycle. And it's the same thing when they're extracting fossil fuels. They are introducing new methane into the biogenic cycle um, or into the atmosphere, I should say. It's not part of the biogenic cycle at that point. And what's significant about that is that we were on a net zero, but if you pull carbon, carbon dioxide essentially, in the form of methane out of the ground where oil and natural gas and all of that is stored, and you, you release that methane into the atmosphere 12 years later, that same methane is going to react just like the methane coming from the cattle. It is going to turn into carbon dioxide. And once it turns into carbon dioxide, since it's supplemental, it's extra because it wasn't part of that biogenic cycle, it will stay in the atmosphere. 
Now, that is what the contention is about global warming, right, is that you've got these greenhouse gases. We're putting more of them into the atmosphere, and they're holding more heat. It's like putting a thicker blanket over you at the night. It holds more heat in, uh, you know, of your body heat. That's what they're saying is going on. That part of the debate I'm not even getting into, but that is the contention here. And when you're pulling out that carbon dioxide that's been trapped down underneath the Earth's surface and you're introducing it into the atmosphere, you are putting supplemental carbon dioxide out there. But cattle are not. Cattle are not because they are only generating carbon dioxide that was already being, has already been uptaken by plant material. So as a net zero, it's really, really good news, you guys. Now, let's talk for a second, though, about the potential here, what, what the implications of all of this are. And let's talk about feeds that can reduce methane gas emission from cattle. This is actually a pretty exciting part of this, especially for those of us who want our industry to be revered and those of us who want to maintain and continue this lifestyle Boy, here is a real positive here, a very exciting part of what I read. So if cow methane has a net zero effect, if it's essentially carbon neutral because it's not adding any additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, um, then at constant emissions rates, there's going to be no effect on warming. It's not going to increase warming of the atmosphere. Now, if you change those emissions, then by, the, by what is being told to us about how greenhouse gases work and how um, global warming works, based on what's being told to us there, if you change those emissions from cattle, then it will have an impact on warming or on cooling. And that is the exciting part. So based on, based on a static emission level from cattle of methane, we're not going to see any warming or cooling. That's a net zero. But of course, if you did something where cattle started emitting more methane into the environment, then ultimately there would be more carbon dioxide after that 12-year period in the atmosphere. And so the, the plants that normally uptake the carbon dioxide, they would not uptake all of the carbon dioxide that was produced by the cattle because they had, had admitted more than what had been the constant. But the exciting part of this is that there are feeds developed. If you look at this on, on the Internet, there's tons of articles about using seaweed to reduce methane emissions by cattle. If you can, if we can come up with a feed source or if we can come up with say and this is just what jumped in my mind if we can come up with some sort of a a block we can put out for our cattle so for example think of when you're going to put cattle out on um on a legume like if you're going to graze them on alfalfa which i did a couple years ago i was really nervous about uh frothy bloat and losing cattle so i put bloat blocks out there i put blocks out there that had uh, like biocarbonate and things like that in it that would that would reduce those gases reduce uh that frothy bloat in the cattle to keep them from bloating i did that to protect the cattle i altered i put i gave them something that they would go consume that would alter uh the gases and things like that in their digestive system to avoid that bloat so what if we could feed the cattle some sort of a feed or put out some sort of a block that would change things in their digestive system so they emitted less methane? And that's really what the key of this article gets to. And it's really very exciting. Because if we did that, and all of a sudden, the same herd of cattle, the same theoretical herd of cattle, they're out there, they're consuming cellulose, they're consuming energy, and they're consuming the carbon dioxide that, uh, that has been out there floating around in the atmosphere. But all of a sudden now, they emit less methane because of how we're feeding them or how we're supplementing them. Then all of a sudden, that means they're emitting less carbon dioxide. And if they are emitting less carbon dioxide... It doesn't change one thing for the plants. The plants still need the same amount of carbon dioxide for them to be able to grow and produce and create cellulose. But if the cattle are not putting all the carbon dioxide back out 
into the atmosphere that the plants originally used to produce that cellulose, then those plants are going to have to grab that carbon dioxide from somewhere else. And they are now going to be grabbing it from the supplemental carbon dioxide that is out there in the atmosphere that's been put out there from all the other sources of methane that we talked about, uh, which is extraction of fossil fuels, organic waste in landfills, wetlands, and then, of course, the other sources of carbon dioxide that we've talked about, the burning of fossil fuels and things like that. And that would have a net cooling effect, which is very, very exciting. You know, right now, there are a lot of people talking about cattle production, talking about methane emissions, and basically saying that we are a scourge on the environment and that we are contributing to global warming because of methane emissions. But we actually have the technology now. We have the research being done, at least at UC Davis, based on this article that I just read, to turn that right on its head and tell people not only are we not contributing to global warming, but we have the ability to contribute to global cooling, to bringing down the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that is super super exciting you know i have been so worried about everything i keep hearing about the environmental impacts of cattle when it comes to global warming because no matter what you believe about global warming it is clear that the belief in global warming and it being human caused is leading policy throughout the entire world and yes of course in the united states and that generates momentum and that's going to impact our industry so, if we can put into place technology that reduces methane emissions and we can talk to people about this biogenic cycle that's written about in this article from UC Davis, then we are in a great position to completely defeat that argument and convince people that not only are cattle great for restoring uh, rangelands, for restoring you know, uh, healthy soils and things like that, but now we are contributing to the betterment of the world by contributing to reducing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and thus slowing the effects of global warming. And that is a very, very exciting development. No matter where you stand on the issue of global warming, this is really, really good news for cattle producers and, of course, producers that raise any ruminant animal. Uh, in production agriculture or otherwise and i was very excited to share that with you and uh really happy to get that out today so you guys arm yourself with that information learn about that read that article it's really not that long it's not difficult to understand i'll link to it in the show notes and hey be ready to defend your industry be ready to defend it and don't put up with these arguments that talk about cattle are the number one contributor to global warming they clearly are not and we have the ability to be a contributor to cooling down the atmosphere and reducing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. All right, everybody, that's what I've got for you this week on our Tuesday edition episode. I hope you'll use that to its full effect. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture. Agriculture.